one. Hello and welcome back to Speak. We are really, really excited to have uh, Chloe on. She's going to do an introduction to herself. You already know me and Elisa. So um, we'll hand over to Chloe to do an intro and then we'll dig into this week's question. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so my name's Chloe Hughes. Um, by background, I'm a public health nutritionist. So my original degree was in public health and nutrition. Um, I then delved into the world of safety um, did a Bosch certificate just to see if I liked safety before embarking on a master's in occupational safety, health and wellbeing um, and came to the end of my master's and went, you know what, I'm really sad that that's over, which is not what I expected <laughs> at all, uh, <laughs> which is quite abnormal, apparently, as well, when I speak to other students and um, and then decided to do a PhD. So I'm currently about to start year four of a part-time PhD in organizational health and well-being. I also work full-time as a well-being practitioner for a large organization. Um, and yeah, that that's me. I also, I love to CrossFit. I also am just starting to become a runner. I feel uncomfortable calling myself a runner at the moment because I did couch to 5K. I have kept up the running yeah. but it's I still feel like mm, Listen, am I a runner though you're a, you're a runner yes you're okay, running, I'm a you're runner running I'm a proud runner, runner. <laughs> runner. Yeah, listen, I, I have to run and walk on minute intervals. If you're not doing that, Chloe, you are a runner, my friend. You are a runner. Sorry. I'm running for about even, half an hour. But... Even if you're walking at intervals, you are still a route you are out fucking running. <laughs> I'll tell you how I know because I don't do it. I am not a runner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you why I know it because I don't run, and I it, that's what I don't want to do. Hang on. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Oh well, thank you for such a wicked um intro, Chloe. And I do not, um, I do not. Uh, oh god, the thought of a PhD while working, and I think you're also planning a wedding as well. I am. I get married in less than two months, so uh, if you see me in a corner crying, that is why. <laughs> <laughs> If it's, it's all got too much. <laughs> yeah, I'm smiling now, but on the inside, tears. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Well, God. Well, firstly, congratulations. Like that's Thank amazing. You. Um, and when you're now getting to the part where it starts to whatever's done is done, and it will, you know, it will be a fantastic day. Um, so the interesting thing about this podcast, usually, or this episode of Speak, um is we don't usually ask people to come into the speak seat. People tend to reach out and say, I've got a question I really want to talk about. But we did a really great episode on menopause. Um, and somebody tagged you in the comments to say, you should get Chloe on to do an episode on reproductive health or an extension of this menopause episode. And I thought, amazing, especially knowing uh, of you beforehand, I thought, what a great, um, what a great idea. And then I thought, well, I have a question. Given you've done so much in this space and you're also doing a PhD and you've got your master's and all that stuff, and also you're working in this space, you are a well-being practitioner for a massive organisation. My kind of question, which is not usual for us to pose it, but my question is, through your studies and your work, what do organisations or leaders not know that we should, like, what have you... Yeah, what, what what should we know that we don't typically? Yeah. Okay, so that's such a big question. Yeah, big yeah question, just things that it? spring to your mind. Um, yeah. So there's quite a lot that, even just to begin with, well being in general, people's well being. I think we've still got such a long way to go maturity wise when it comes to that conversation. Um, and it is it's beginning to come. You've seen quite a significant increase in the in the topic around mental well-being, mental health. People are a little bit more comfortable talking about that. If we think about menopause across the last five years, significant change in that space. Mm. Um, no one was talking about menopause when I so I my um, master's dissertation was specifically on menopause in the workplace and this was before what I'm going to call like the Davina effect where Davina McCall started talking about menopause it's on yeah. tv um, and then suddenly you saw more people talking about it um, but prior to that no one was really talking about menopause there was a small subset of group groups from like a, a workplace perspective that were beginning this conversation um, and there was a handful of research papers 
And it was only because my mother-in-law to be um, at the time was going through perimenopause and she worked in a school. So quite a female dominated workplace. And I was chatting to her and she was telling me about it. And I was thinking, I'm surprised you don't have much of a support network considering you work with women, but actually they didn't feel comfortable talking with each other about it. And I was like, well, if you're not comfortable, how does it feel to work in like a male dominated workplace, like where I work? Um, and that's kind of where where my interest in menopause began and how I started talking about it in the workplace. So that's where my master's dissertation came from. And, and that opened the door for me then to start talking about it more widely. So initially I began just mentioning it more often um which got some really interesting responses back I think a couple of times I was told Chloe it could be really detrimental to your career to be known as the menopause woman <laughs> and I was like what I was like I don't care at this point bear in mind I was probably like a year two years into my role at the time um and I was working in safety at, at that time too um but I just persevered and actually through doing that have created a network of over 300 women um, that come together on a monthly basis um, for a menopause cafe and I have women that work external to my organization still join that cafe because they love it so much and they don't have it in their workplace um, and actually the more I spoke to um, individuals that were going through menopause at work the more I went okay we need to keep at this and kind of expand on it as well because I was looking and going okay women get to say 51 on average and reach menopause and suddenly the expectation now is for them to be really open about their experience of menstruation be really open about all these symptoms that they're experiencing when that has never been socially acceptable for them for the last well the whole working life um so there's a lot of literature on the impact of menstruation in school working uh, school age children and also in university students and then there's this huge gap of kind of what I'd call midlife where you're, where you're just working and then you're reaching menopause and suddenly we're interested again at menopause at the point of menopause and that kind of made me go well let's open the doors there with menstruation and that's kind of where my PhD work's coming in so from my perspective there's so much that we have to learn from a reproductive health health side of things and not just from a female experience but also kind of those that are indirectly impacted as well um also trans non-binary individuals that we're just not even close to to having these conversations in some areas like it depends i think on the workplace and if they've got somebody who's confident enough but also that's in a psychologically safe environment where they can actually start to broach these topics. And so I come from a place of privilege in so far as I'm not menopausal at the moment. I know that one day I most likely will be, um, but at the moment I'm not. So I was able to talk really openly about menopause and know that it wasn't going to have the biggest impact on my career at this moment in time, but actually broaching the, the topic of menstruation in the workplace is a if, is a different kettle of fish mm. um because I have personal experience but also because I have a menstrual disease disease so I have endometriosis myself um and so there's a, there's a lot more on the line now maybe with some of these conversations um but yeah in on the topic of reproductive health what don't we know that we need to know yeah I don't even think I could tell you because I I don't think from a research perspective, we even know, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface. The surface. And even then it's like the tiniest pinprick um, compared to what I imagine it will be in a couple of years time. Yeah, I think um, that really interesting because I wrote down as you were talking about um, that menopause has got this sort of suddenly, this real weight or buoyancy behind it in terms of its conversation. And I I, I just wrote, why? Question mark. And you called it the Davina effect. And then I remember, obviously, I started listening to her podcast in preparation for our, our menopause um, episode, etc. And I think, <clears throat> I think it's really interesting. I don't know if it was you, Elisa, that told me the story about... Um, 
so, uh, an older gentleman saying, I don't know why everyone's make, suddenly making a fuss. Like my wife went through it and she didn't, was it you that told no, me? No, it was, it was one of the women on the episode, I think. That's right. Um, and they just said like, you know, my wife went through and it was like, no, no one, it was no big drama. Why are we talking about it? And actually when then the wife was asked, she said, actually I had an awful time, but I was at home and kind of hidden. So nobody really understood the struggle that we were going through because we were housewives um, when I was going through it. And typically women were housewives when I was going through it and nobody saw it. Um, and I, I find it really interesting that now you have really big drivers on diversity in the workplace, gender diversity in the workplace. And we want women on our boards and women in CEOs and women in to have equal opportunity across the board. Right. But we have to start really considering things we've never had to consider and I think given when we're talking about sort of um, menstruation in the workplace and, and in school and universities and all those sorts of things, you just learn to get on with it. And it doesn't even occur to me that there is ignorance on the other side of that in, in the workplace about what I might need. And then I'm like, oh, God, that's because I've been conditioned to shut up and deal with it because... It, it's not a consideration in my in any workplace because if we choose to be there you deal with being in agony once a month um and I think the I might have said it on this last episode one of the really interesting conversations <laughs> that I had in recent years was um having quite considerable well getting really sick um and then somebody saying to me in a really trusted group, so it's my my guys, somebody saying in front of everybody, like, did you know? Did you did you feel that you were slipping? Um, and I I've had a diagnosis of uh, FND, so functional neurological disassociation. So I lost my ability to speak and think and all those sorts of things. They thought I had a stroke. And uh, somebody in the room said, Did you feel, did you feel yourself getting sick? Did you feel something changing? And I said, Yeah. And they said, well, why didn't you were with us? The day the big thing happened, you were with us and we have huge psychological safety. Why didn't you say? And I was like, it's not what women do, mate. And I said, we are conditioned to walk into a room. And this is the example I gave. We are conditioned to walk into a room, particularly big rooms like boardrooms, right? And if you have cramp, and I mean crippling cramp, I said, you can't just walk to the front of the room and say, sorry if I'm slightly off a game or sorry if I'm slightly chill. This isn't nerves. I'm, you know, I'm on my period and it's really, really painful. So just bear with me a second. Um, I said, you don't have to do that. You suck it up. You say nothing. You take ibuprofen. You nail the presentation. You get out and you go huddle in the toilet and you hold yourself and take a breath. And... As I was talking about, the, just using the phrase, it's not like I could say I'm on my period. Somebody in the room went, oh. And the person who asked me the question in the beginning said, that's the problem. Right. We're all we've all got partners. We've all got wives. And he said, you know, what? I think it's disgusting. I think it's disgusting that if a guy had got up in front of a board with an injury and had limped to the front. We'd see him as a hero. How do you do that, mate? He sort of did it at rugby or did it at what? And he'd be a hero. And we'd be like, oh, bless him, look him limping. But a woman could limp in because she's got endometriosis or she's having a hot flush because of menopause or she's sweating through her shirt. And we would not receive that pain in the same way. And I just think that's, for me, even educating myself that that's not okay, I have to remind myself because... I've been working for 25, 20, whatever, over 20 years. And that's what I expect of myself. And I have to understand that's conditioning. It's, yeah. Absolutely. And this is it's so typical that, that women do this all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I speak to a lot of women going through the menopause that, have, as you said, hidden their menopause for so long from their partners, people that they live with, um, and spend so much time with and and don't talk a, yeah. about it with their partners but they talk about anything else with them but not not their their gynecological health and I find that really interesting um and it's definitely something that I think needs to change a lot of it comes from stigma and a discomfort sorry if you can hear my dog barking um a lot of it comes from stigma and discomfort in 
what I think is the fact that a lot of people don't understand these topics very well. So I'm fearful of getting it wrong, but I'm also fearful um, because I don't understand it. And so it becomes stigmatized and taboo and we don't discuss these things. And interestingly, when you were talking about kind of how you've had to hide things in the past, there's a really interesting paper um, by by Sang et al, I think off the top of my head, um, and it's called Blood Work. Um, so she's named the additional labor that comes with managing your menstrual cycle in the workplace, managing your menstrual blood, and flow um managing your pain and discomfort and called that blood work as an additional labor that women or those that menstruate experience um which i love that there's now a term for that because uh interestingly i had this conversation with somebody the other day about the amount of thought that has to go into kind of just say if i have to go to a conference i went to a conference a couple couple of weeks ago um because i've got endometriosis I had to make sure that in my bag I had a pay, spare pair of knickers just in case. Um, I also had pain relief just in case. The coffee that I had on the way down to the conference was caffeine of decaf because I know that caffeine can flare me up, so I avoid that. Um, I wore clothes that I knew if I sw swell up in or or get a flare up in, um, no one's going to notice and no one's going to make comment on it because they're not tight fitting clothes um and just so many different like additional labor that just yeah. goes into the thought of me just going to a conference yeah. which maybe somebody else wouldn't even have to think about and in the past I've not had to think in that much detail but as kind of my illness has progressed a lot more thought has to just go into how I manage myself on a day-to-day -day, that when you're already busy and you've got a lot going on in life, it's just extra and it exhausts you some days and you just think I could really do without this. Um, yeah. But I think so many women have similar experiences and it, like, obviously I'm talking from, from a health related um, perspective, but even if you have children, the additional labor that just goes into looking after a child, if you have pets, the additional thought process of, Oh yeah, I need to make sure that they've got, the water before I head out I need to make sure that if I'm not going to be back on time I I can call somebody to go and let them out and that sort of thing um so I think going back to your initial question one of the things I hope all leaders know is that people are people they have lives outside of work yes. um and just because you have a perception of what you need them to do by the end of a work day doesn't mean there isn't a million other things that's going on in their lives that know they're not going to just be able to leave at the door I used to hate when people said uh would would say I'll just leave that at the door like I come home um and I'll leave work at the door like I can't leave work at the door very often if something's bothered me I'm, I need to talk it out with my partner but equally if something's happening in my life I'm not going to come into work and be my usual self. I've probably got something in the back of my mind. And I think that's really important as well. If you're thinking from a safety perspective, if you've got people undertaking safety critical activity, you cannot um, expect them to be a machine because they've got lives outside of work. And that is going to le leak into their working life, whether you like that or not. And so it's so important that, Obviously, reproductive is, health is one element, but ultimately, if you think of well-being, people are coming into work who are depressed. People are coming into work who have got financial difficulties at the moment. People are coming into work who maybe have just experienced a miscarriage. There's, there's things going on in people's lives and the expectation is that they still come into work. And in some cases, that's OK. Maybe that's going to help them. But ultimately, that life doesn't get just dropped at the door when they get to work, that it continues with them wherever they go. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, well, actually, before I jump in, Elisa, I feel like I've talked a load. Thoughts so far, girl? Um, thoughts so far, I love the term blood work, by the way. Um, and what actually came into my mind was that thing that came out recently, I don't know if you saw the article came out recently about period products actually not being fucking tested on menstrual blood they're <laughs> tested on water so they don't yeah. fucking work like the absorbency rates we're talking about it's all bullshit but anyway of course let me guess it's probably done by a man 
Um, but the thing that's actually springing to mind, and you kind of mentioned at the top of like kind of well-being, and we talk about like mental health and, and all this stuff and how this thing with, especially with say the menopause, now that it's getting a bit, a bit of backing, that all of a sudden people are expected to be able to speak to it mm. when they never did before. And then what came into my mind was, you know, that phrase of it's OK to, not to be OK, that whole yeah. mental health thing, which I think is bullshit, to be honest, um, because I don't think it's not that I don't think people mean it. It's that people, the people who are saying it aren't we're not equipped. Um, and when we're faced with the reality of what not OK looks like, people yeah. go it's a bit like actually come come and tell me your heroic story after you've come out the other end of it and that's really inspiring but if you come to me when you're in the fucking doldrums or when you're after having a flooding and there's blood all over your trousers that's actually too much and I can't look that in the eye yeah that's the grimmest moment right and that's like and that's when we need to that's when we need to be able to say no this is actually I'm here I'll listen I'll fucking I'll run to the shop and get you new knickers or whatever it is but we're not we are not ready I just don't think anyone's ready. I think that's an issue. In the world of well-being, I, I see this quite a lot. So in the world of mental health, where you've got people that um, maybe trauma dump um, their lived experiences, but mm. don't. there's no signpost to support. There's no infrastructure for support. The same with, for instance, um, the topic of fertility um, is one that, that's coming up a lot at the moment. Yep. And... So people really want to share their stories and their experiences. If you in a big organization like like I'm in, people want to share um, those experiences to support and help others. One of the challenges we have with that is and, and one of the things I'm trying to prevent from from happening in within my organization is we do these stories. We share these these very distressing, sometimes personal experiences but we have no infrastructure within the organization to support anyone who has gone through a similar experience. Yeah. Um, and I see it in a lot of, a lot of areas, especially in wellbeing, um, where this is happening. And so I'm really keen that I absolutely think these topics should be spoken about, but I really think they need to be informed by the evidence base. So we need to know that the approaches that we're taking are evidence based and we know that they work before we go down a route of, I just think this is the right thing to do. No, we need to make sure that it actually is the right thing to do and we have the yeah. data to prove it. Yeah. Um, also that when we do have these conversations, it's not, by the way, this really horrible thing happened to me, but I got out the other end. It's okay, this happened. And this is how you, as a person who's just read this, and maybe having a similar experience can actually access support for yourself, be that through the organization or be that through an external organization that we partner with or work with. And I think that's really important because otherwise all you're doing is a little bit of shouting into the void and telling people that bad things happen, but there's no way for them to know how to help themselves or how to help others in those experiences. So I'm at the moment working on a reproductive health strategy. I will not put out anything around reproductive health until I know we've got the foundations in place so that when we do start talking about it, there's actually signposting for all the support we have. We've got guidance documents that back that up. We've got signposting to some of our policies that support that. You can't just go out and, and, and I totally recognise people are impatient they want to see the change happening but if you do it wrong and you push it too fast without actually putting the infrastructure in place all that's going to happen is you're going to distress people probably quite a lot yeah. um, and make them feel like nobody actually cares because yes you've said this is important but you've done nothing to back that up but Chloe you can call the EAP <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you can. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> oh, sorry, but, but really, yeah, shady. That, that is that's brilliant. But yeah, no, and that's what we don't want to happen. I think it's really important that those infrastructures are in place because otherwise, you just disengage people on the topic, and they go, "Well, you've said you care. You've talked about it." You did it for a day, maybe. Maybe it was a specific day, World Mental Health Day, for example. But actually going on, what are you really doing to demonstrate to me 
regularly that you actually care. I think that's what really matters. And I think they're starting to call this well-being washing. Um, so kind of like green greenwashing has been, we've also in the well-being world now picked up well-being washing because we're seeing it in a lot of organizations. They wanna, they want kind of the sexy what looks good, but actually when it comes to the nitty gritty, what needs to happen, that's really unsexy. It's actually looking at your policies and making sure it's really clear to people what support they can access. Yeah. That's not fun to them. And so they go, oh, I don't want to do that. But <laughs> actually that's what that's what some of my job is. And people might say that's boring, but actually I see that making real change within organizations. And actually that tends to take the most time because you have to speak to seniors you're changing some of the policy to to include wording that maybe didn't exist before or hadn't really been considered yeah. and somebody might say oh oh yeah well that would be encompassed within that would it though because we haven't actually said it explicitly and a lot of people need to see it in black and white to to be willing to to actually implement it yeah yeah I think this uh, it also feels like the space so it, what it made me think about was when well-being first started popping up and you had organizations that did like fruity friday and just re plug <laughs> the cycle to work scheme and everyone just got a tax-free bike and all this rubbish and he had the people doing the thing like and they were able to say publicly like oh we have a well-being program and we do all these things and my question was always how is it helping like have you actually assess the well-being of your organization in any like even just like even if it's not the best most scientific way have you in some way surveyed the actual problems of your organization the actual well-being impacts of health and safety psychological safety like just every all of it and then produced a plan that says we're going to do these things on well-being to tackle actual problems that we have no was probably the overwhelming response but we have free fridays and people are going to get on a train and go to all of our offices on friday and deliver a basket of fruit oh, i don't swear i really want i was to like do it do it i was like you were about to do it I'm like just fuck off just <laughs> thank you yoga and yoga and fuck off just yeah just uh, just just go just fuck off with it <laughs> it drives me mad because what it really does is then undermine what well-being really is when people don't feel like well-beings and they've got this plastering of an organization saying we're great at well-being and you're like are you who have you asked that your program is helping in any way who what feedback have you got that says this program works and is creating better working environments to create better and more well people and then you fast forward to now and people are really making inroads people like you chloe right studying the bejesus out of the topic to make sure and challenging major organizations on policy and access to resources and no just don't put out a trauma storm like a trauma story and leave everybody hanging make sure that we have signposts while that is shifting we still have organizations that with the best intent in the world i'm sure that say let's let's pull together a well-being working group and let's just do stuff that feels like the right thing. Stop it. It is no different to doing a massive risk assessment to say, where are our well-being impacts? Please look at your control. Please look at what you're doing to mitigate the impact, to make it better, and just target it. Because otherwise, you're not actually caring about individuals. You are just doing something that looks good on paper, and it's garbage. Sorry, yeah. it's not usually my space to rant. I like it there's passion behind it that's what <laughs> that's what we need um absolutely there's there's definitely there's lots of different types of well-being I'd say and, and it as well it depends on where well-being sits within organizations I think there's sometimes well-being sits within HR sometimes it sits within DNI sometimes it sits within health and safety um and it depends on the person and the approach that they're taking I will always take an evidence-based approach to well-being because what I don't want and what I hear so frequently is, but that's the pink and fluffy stuff. Yeah. And I hate it when people people <laughs> say that because I'm like, I've studied this extensively. It's not pink and fluffy. There's real evidence based behind it. We yeah. can save organizations money. We can make people happier in work. It's a win-win. Yes. But it's different. And it's 
a little bit of the unknown for a lot of organizations because it's not what they've done before and it might feel light touch in comparison to kind of what they're used to from health and safety like if you look at from a health perspective occupational health that's very much we're killing people um and it's really it might be really down the road but it's glaringly obvious the same with safety as we can physically see and we can provide real-time data for a lot of it granted it might be lagging but we can provide that data mm-hmm. it's much harder to demonstrate that well-being works it is possible but it involves investment and it involves yes. engagement from senior leaders and it takes time to to see the outcomes of that as well you're not gonna I don't know implement a, a I don't know your free fruit or your yoga and and see an instant change one because that will not work yeah. um but two because you wouldn't see the impact of well-being until way down the road and so again it's not sexy data because it takes time mm. um and that can be challenging for a lot of people because they want to see the ROI straight away and I'm like I can't give that to you yet um, but also I need you to invest in order to be able to give that to you in the future. But you're going to have to wait for that. And again, that's not very sexy to them. You know um, what as well? There's something so fucking gendered about somebody saying that's the pink and fluffy stuff. And yeah. that makes me fucking rage. Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. You want my ears. I'm like, I can't believe you've just said that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard that so many times and it's I've so frustrating. Nuts. And it undermines, in in my opinion, it undermines the work that goes into organisational health and wellbeing. But yeah. again, it's quite, it's quite a new concept. Like people, my, my PhD is very new. Like not many people have. I think there's maybe one or two cohorts before the year that I started. So it'd only been running a couple of years before I joined. Um, and the same with my masters was relatively new in the world of wellbeing. There, there's not many courses on this topic. Um, And so historically, you do have people that work in well-being, but maybe it's a role that they've been put into because they were really passionate about well-being. But ultimately, they don't recognise the the evidence base or it's not something that they've been made fully aware of because it's not actually their background. Um, They might be a HR professional or um, just somebody that has a personal love of health and well-being which is amazing and we need lots of people like that but equally strategies need to be informed by evidence base to to ensure that they're actually delivering what we need them to deliver to see the outcomes that we need to see in this space otherwise we're going to continue to kind of go around in the cycle of this works but we're not quite able to demonstrate fully how it works in a way that is nice for for people who work within businesses Mm. who haven't maybe got health background either that's when I talk to well-being with health professionals they totally get it because that's their background and they see the the outcomes of the future but if you're talking to people who work specifically within business they're used to kind of the op side of things what I'm giving them is so different and so far removed to what they're used to. And so it's it's like we're talking different languages and we I, it's something that I've reflected on. I need to be bilingual. I need to be able to talk both languages and recognize that, yes, I can I can see it, but I need to be able to explain to you in a way that you understand yeah. what's going to happen in the future. And I think wellbeing professionals at the moment, it's just taking time for us to learn some of those skills. Yeah. And, and do you know what? And it's not that is it's a really, really key leadership skill, um, yeah. actually, particularly for an SME. It doesn't matter what SME, if you are passionate, geeking out, data driven, or even if it's just like the topic really floats your boat. One of the really key thing I saw something really cool yesterday about you get to a certain point being an SME and being brilliant. And then you get from that point to the top by learning to put people at ease because you're the SME. That that top part is all about how you make other people feel that you've got this. Don't you worry, I'm nailing it. I'm the competent person, I'm off. Um, And I've got a lot of my my train of thought. Blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, so I think my roundabout point was going to be yes so it's it, the whole bilingual thing making it relevant to a board to a leader to an influence to a stakeholder is 
necessary in health, safety, well-being, environment, ESG, whatever it is. It's, you know, learning to translate that is, is a core skill. Um, and what else I was thinking about as you were talking at the end there was I wonder whether it I still feel like when we talk about health and safety, what we really talk about is safety. Very, very rarely do we talk about health and safety yeah. unless something's gone really wrong when somebody's ended up with some kind of occupational asthma and we're not looking at the health impact of the workplace. We're looking at the safety impact of the workplace and well-being is the evolution for me i mean i was talking to somebody from the the science division of the of the hse recently and saying for me well-being is the evolution of health and safety this is just how i see it and i know it sits in lots of different pots and different organizations but in health and safety you've always had a rich cousin poor cousin and health has been the poor cousin in well-being it's almost like they're equal counterparts we know both of them have an equal effect on the well-being of a person as well as their environment working conditions like all of the things um and actually we're not even ready for health as a pure discussion we're not even ready to treat those as equal counterparts let alone evolve the conversation on from health to holistic well-being of individuals and, and workforces so i think but this is the good work I think the people that are doing this at the beginning of this journey, Chloe, the people like you and all those that are passionate in this in this area and us, really trying to drive this agenda forward in 10 years time, when everybody is talking about reproductive health in the workplace, there is free period products everywhere. We're able to have better conversations and we are supporting people. It's because we chose we chose the tricky road. We mm -hmm. chose the challenge not the slippers like and it will be down to it will be down to us that there was difference made and the Davine is speaking about it uh just an note on the free period products if anybody listening to this disagrees that there should be free period products drop me a message i'll fucking fight you fight <laughs> because if men had periods like it's no it is not different to toilet paper there is no difference is, no like and what? it makes what? such a difference and I was saying to to somebody the other day actually um I've never had had a point in my life where I've needed a period product and a woman who even I don't know has been more than willing to give me a tampon a pad it didn't matter if I didn't know them they could have been a random on the street yeah. I've done it I've done it before in a bathroom and been like oh I'm so sorry I'm caught out have you got anything and they're like yeah here we go and yeah. you know tampons are expensive so are pads yeah. but we're always willing and I've done it to, for so many people before myself where I've been like oh yeah here take this so having free period products it's will make the the biggest difference to people um of all ages and it does it even to be honest children when they get caught out I remember when I had my fifth period oh my god I had nothing on me at the time women who were menopausal who were flooding getting caught out with flooding it's invaluable having those products available to you yeah. whenever you might need them as you said as important as toilet paper absolutely it's, it's even when you say actually even when you use the phrase words children i'm like oh my god we were children when we started menstruating whereas you just kind of you figure like, oh teenagers whatever like one of my friends had her first period like when she was nine years of age and like we kind of go, oh, periods, that's a like, oh, that's a woman issue. And you go, no, fucking kids, man. Like we need to be all over this. More children are now experiencing periods younger as well. So the average age is 12, but um I know eight-year-olds that have started to get the the menses. So yeah, young children as young as eight, even probably younger, are getting their menses. My daughter is eight. The, th the thought of her going through that pain is like devastating because it's it's it is like we were but like we were reading like shout and ms magazine and all this stuff right and we were fucking psyched it was like who's going to get their period first it was like six of us in a group at, at primary school and who's going to get it first and next thing you started happening and everyone was like this is awful oh no <laughs> like went from being so excited and then it was like why the fuck were we excited about this yeah i was I was 14 and I remember being so upset because all my friends had their periods yeah. and I didn't and I finally got it and 
well it took me 11 years to get I was back and forth to the doctors for 11 years trying to get my endometriosis diagnosis because I was in so much pain and I experienced so much bleeding and I was so unwell with it um but it just goes to show I was desperate for it and now I do anything to completely get rid of it. Actually, actually just before we do wrap up on the endo stuff like 11 years 11 fucking years waiting for trying to get a diagnosis. And I, I just wonder, could you touch on that thing of the medical profession, that how dismissive they are of women's pain. And it's that thing of you have to be able to advocate for yourself. Yeah. I've had a real challenge. So I'm all for advocating for yourself. And it's something that I share all the time with my menopause cafe, because so many of them have had similar experiences where they've experienced medical gaslighting. Mm. I was told for years, there is nothing wrong with you. It's psychological. And I knew it wasn't psychological um, because I was in so much pain. Mm. And I knew that that wasn't normal, but I didn't have the confidence because I was like, you're a doctor. I need to trust you. And it wasn't until I was doing my PhD um, and I was reading more and more around menstruation and the topic of menstruation that I went, this is so abnormal, the experience that I'm having. Um, And then during COVID, it got much worse, like significantly worse to the point that I couldn't walk anymore because I'd be in pain just walking and it wasn't just during my my um my actual cycle my period it was about well to be honest every day maybe I'd have one or two days where I wasn't in pain um and it started affecting all aspects of my life I couldn't exercise I didn't want to leave the house anymore I became extremely depressed um because I genuinely felt like I was crazy I was like why are they telling me there's nothing wrong with me but I can't even move anymore without being in pain um I did therapy just in case because I was had literally been gaslit that much into thinking I need therapy because I clearly have some kind of disorder for thinking something like that I'm in this much pain um and eventually I I advocate for myself because I I equipped myself with all the knowledge I possibly could (laughs) on endometriosis because it was in my family as well there was family history of it and um I finally went to a doctor she completely dismissed me again and I'd had a couple of run-ins with her so I was like right I just want you to refer me I was like I want a referral to a gynecologist to which she refused to to which I said I want that on my notes then that you've refused she changed her mind pretty fast then and agreed when I saw the gynae, she was like, oh, yeah, this sounds like endometriosis. I can't believe it's taken you this long. Um, and then I ended up the wait list just to be seen um, but by a specialist in endometriosis was two years. And I just was like, I, I mentally and physically cannot last another two years like this. Um, and so I was really fortunate my parents were able to help me out. Um, and I went privately to see a specialist and he was like, yes, let's do a diagnostic laparoscopy. Turns out I had adhesions. My bladder was adhered to my uterus, which was causing me all that pain when I was walking. Mm. Um, and, and I was like, I knew I wasn't crazy, but I had to jump through all of those hoops. I had to have a surgery before somebody Listen. agreed that there were that I had endometriosis and that there was something not right there and I just thought this is crazy because my lived experience of pain it shouldn't matter whether I had endometriosis or not mm-hmm. I was in physical pain and I should have been um supported through that so that was really difficult for me um but it's something that I do with my menopause ladies is say to them advocate for yourself you know your body better than anyone else does yeah. Um, and so if anyone's listening today and you think something's not right, advocate for yourself <laughs> and challenge because I wouldn't have had a diagnosis. I wouldn't be living a life now that I'm enjoying again if it weren't for the fact that I, that I advocated for myself. And it's really sad that it's like that. And it happens to women all the time. Unfortunately, if you go into A&E um, with abdominal pain, As a woman, I can't remember the percentage off the top of my head, but you are X percent more likely to actually die um, Mm -hmm. than a man because they'll put it down to menstrual pain. 
Yeah, and I think, I think the stats are even, they're even higher than for black women or women of colour. Yeah. I was going to say the research around the the, dismiss it, the the dismissal of pain thresholds in, in black or women of colour is, is ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, and I think there's, there's probably a, a whole other episode around um, like medical gaslighting, pain thresholds being dismissed, etc., um, and I, I think, it, I mean, I walked into A&E having been told by um, a nurse that I was having a stroke, unable to speak. And the lady told me to go and sit down. And I was like, and I was trying to say to her and get out. I have been told I'm having a stroke. And she said, somebody will be around in a minute. And I just, and I, to actually advocate for yourself when you can't speak is quite a mission. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Somebody taking you seriously, even when you said the word stroke and I have been told by a nurse to come here and being told well somebody's on break you'll just have to wait and it took somebody to shout over my head to say she's having a stroke somebody get her some paracetamol some aspirin and to see her so I think that whole thing around like yeah that dismissal pain threshold is just disgusting actually and maybe it goes back to that whole point about we're supposed to stand up and we do stand up in pain and deliver our work and we say nothing whether we're flooding <laughs> aching broken we stand up and we deliver because we're not taken seriously if we say anyway or everyone grimaces and gets uncomfortable like we've done something wrong by sharing that we are in pain so yeah i think your call to action there chloe and definitely didn't want to hijack that i want to come right back to it about advocate for yourself and if anyone knows something isn't right and you know in your gut no pun intended um absolutely do it thrive and i love that tip chloe which is if somebody is refusing you help please formally document that in my notes to say yeah. you've refused me help that's a brilliant tactic um and yeah thank you for all of those shares today i think there's quite a lot for um leaders to think about in terms of make sure the policy really reflects support make sure that when you're saying you're doing like a well-being program or you're sharing trauma stories, make sure we have true signposts to proper support and we're not just leaving people hanging in the wind. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this discussion with you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, at least any like closing thoughts, any anything on your mind? Um, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this topic. Uh, there's multiple topics, like we could have so many spin-off episodes off of this, yeah. to be honest. And <laughs> so much. I love it. Getting, like for sharing that, definitely that last piece, I actually think that, I just think any person who menstruates that listens to this um, and will get value from it. And, and I want to hat tip as well to your real inclusive language at the start of like, trans non-binary people who menstruate and if you have a problem with that also yep. fucking me. <laughs> and i will fight you i will fucking fight you love it amazing chloe i mean any sort of like just closing thoughts anything on your mind anything you didn't say to the audience that you'd love to say i think for me it's just remember if you are a leader listening to this that people are people they have lives outside of work um there's things going on that they probably will not talk to you about or feel that they can't talk to you about and actually what are you doing to create a psychologically safe environment to to make people feel like actually i could talk about that element of my life or maybe they don't have to fully go into the details of it but they could allude to it even i think is a big step in the right direction mm-hmm. um I feel really hopeful for the future of leadership. Um, I think that the way that that the world is at the moment and a lot of the younger generation have a really good way of thinking of things and are much more inclusive um, than than even my generation. So I'm really excited to see where, where the world goes going forward. And most things I'm pessimistic about, but when it comes to, <laughs> when I, unfortunately climate and all that, um, But when it comes to actually the future of leaders, the future of feeling like you can be your best self at work, Mm -hmm. I think we're heading in the right direction. It's just getting the right people in those leadership positions, getting people who are people people to be people leaders. I think we're going to be on the right track and it's really exciting to see. Amazing. 
Well, cool. thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for everybody for tuning in to this episode of Speak. Join us in a couple of weeks for the next episode. Bye. Yeah.